you to address. And Lord, as we open your word this morning, speak to our hearts about how to lay down our burdens before you. You are the one to whom we go to to lift our heads to lay down our burdens. In your son's name, amen. In India, in rural roads in India, if you walk down a road, you will occasionally come across a post with a sturdy shelf on it about shoulder height. These posts are called Soma Tonga, which means resting place. As people travel on foot and they're carrying large loads, large burdens on their head and shoulders, they can stop at a Soma Tonga and place their heavy load on the shelf for relief. It is a place to just simply rest their burdens for a short time, short time before carrying on with their journey. Christians in India started calling Jesus my Soma Tonga, my resting place. Jesus desires to be the one we go to to rest our burdens. Jesus said so in Matthew 11. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and overburdened, heavy laden, and I will give you rest, right? Put on my yoke and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's a promise from God's word that he can be the place that we go to to rest our burdens. Jesus wants to be that one for you. In 2 Samuel 15, go ahead and turn there, we read about a time in David's life where he was heavy burdened. He was on the run for his life. There were so many things that David needed God's attention for in his life. 2 Samuel 15, and what we see is the uh, time when David's son, Absalom, started a coup against David and took the throne for himself, and David went on the run for his life in order to protect Jerusalem. He left the throne. He left Jerusalem unless they would attack the city in order to get the throne. So in this passage, Absalom is starting a coup, and then David escapes. So 2 Samuel 15, this is the heavy burden of David. It says in verse 1, after this it happened that Absalom provided himself with chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. Now Absalom would rise early and stand beside the way to the gate. So it was whenever anyone who had a lawsuit came to the king for a decision, that Absalom would call to him and say, what city are you from? And he would say, your servant is from such and such a tribe of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, look, your case is good and right, but there is no deputy of the king to hear you. Moreover, Absalom would say, oh, that I were made judge in the land, and anyone who has any suit or cause would come to me that I would give him justice. And so it was whenever anyone came near to bow down to him, that he would put out his hand and take him and kiss him. In this manner, Absalom acted toward all Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. You get what he's doing? He spent years. Everybody that would come to the king for a complaint, Absalom would say, I am the guy that will take care of this. I will deal with this for you. And he became so, uh, Israel became so enamored with Absalom. He acted in a way to win the hearts of Israel. Jump down to verse 13, or verse 12, excuse me. Jump to verse 12. It says, Then Absalom sent for Ahithophel, the Gileanite, David's counselor from his city, from Gilo, where he offered sacrifices. And the conspiracy grew strong, for the people were with Absalom continually increasing in number. So Absalom sent out spies to the land. He got all the people to be on his side. This is the son of David trying to steal the throne for himself. 
Verse 13. Now a messenger came to David saying, the hearts of men, the hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. So David said to all his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, arise and let us free, let us flee, excuse me, or we shall not escape from Absalom. Make haste to depart, lest he overtake us suddenly and bring disaster upon us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. So long story short, David didn't want to see himself and his men die at the hands of Absalom. He didn't want to see Absalom attack the city. So he left. And Absalom took the throne for himself. And you can read uh, about what happens in the, in the coming uh, chapters. But basically, Absalom increases in authority, and he pursues David to kill David. David is God's anointed. David is the one that God chose to be king. So Absalom isn't going to remain the king. But for a time, David is on the run for his life. Absalom ends up dying. Uh, a great pity for David to watch his son die after, after trying to steal the throne from him. But during this initial time, as David is fleeing in the wilderness, he, he, he is heavy laden. He is heavy burdened, as you could imagine. His son has betrayed him, and he writes the words of Psalm 63. Now go ahead and turn back to Psalm 63. But before we get into that, I want to ask you, what is your burden that you're carrying? Think about it for a moment. What are the stresses of life that ail you? But more than that, sometimes we can see the, all the Christian disciplines that we're supposed to maintain. When we fall short of them, it can feel like a bit of a burden for us, right? Right? If you look at the laundry list of things that you're supposed to do well as a Christian, making disciples, helping out in church, being hospitable to strangers, spending adequate time in prayer, waking up early and doing devotions, fasting, family devotions, praying with your spouse, praying with your kids, praying with your grandkids, leading your family members to the Lord, leading your neighbors to the Lord. And you might look at this laundry list of things that you have to do, and somewhere along the line, it can start to feel like a little bit of a burden, right? It can feel like a little bit of a chore. Everybody here can relate to that idea on some level, right? I know I can. And sometimes the, the things that the Lord requires out of us can feel like a chore. What do you do when you are burdened with all these things? Maybe you're struggling with sin and you fall short of, of where you want to be with the Lord. Where do you go with these burdens? When David is burdened, he lays down his burden by resting in the love of God. That's what we see in Psalm 63. You and I, we, we, we often feel like we're burdened. We often feel like we're, we're not adequate. We're not good enough to, to maintain this laundry list of Christian disciplines, and it can feel like a, a bit overwhelming, a bit too much at times. And I want to share with you the way we see David lay down his burden is by first humbling yourself and then resting in the love of God. Humbling yourself is first. This is what Jesus says in Luke chapter 9. He says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. To be a disciple, to carry whatever burden God has for you to carry, whether it's stress in life or it's the, the difficulty of the Christian disciplines that you feel like you fall inadequate in, the first step in carrying that burden, according to Jesus, is to deny yourself. It's to deny yourself. It's if to say, my feelings don't matter. I'm going to do what God calls me to do. Denying yourself. The root of, of, of this idea of denying yourself, denying your feelings, is seen several times in Scripture, including James 4. You want to carry your burden? You want to do well for the Lord? You want to take upon yourself what God asks you to do? Then understand that it starts with denying yourself and humbling yourself. James 4 says, where do wars and fights come from among you? 
Do they not come from your desires for pleasure, that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Verse 6, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. You don't see what this passage is saying. You struggle with, with, with wars and fightings and stresses in your life, and it's often a cause of your desires for pleasure. You want to feel good. You want to feel good about yourself. You want to pursue what feels good. And, and so when you do that, it causes problems. There's fighting inside you. There's a spiritual battle that goes on. But when we want to say to ourselves that I want to follow my feelings, I want to do whatever it, it feels good to me, that's going to cause problems. But when we deny ourselves and tell our feelings who's in charge, God sees that discipline. And verse 6 says, he gives grace to the humble. So the, it, it, in the foundation of Christianity, <clears throat> excuse me, and the foundation of living for the Lord and the, and the very 101 of Christianity is this idea that you can't do whatever feels good. You have to deny yourself. And when you do that, you're going to find your burden is lifted when you get to the reality of verse 6. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Do you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Do you want to be filled with the fullness of God? Do you want to have grace from outside of yourself, from God, given to you? It starts with denying yourself. How can you get through carrying all your burdens of this life on your own shoulders? You can't. God wants you to be dependent upon him. You have to admit that you can't do it. And then how do you handle doing this laundry list of Christian disciplines all on your own? You can't. You have to admit that. Your heart longs for the pleasures, the desires for pleasure. But when we lay that down, God gives grace. <clears throat> we tend to follow our feelings. If it was only a matter of following our feelings, it would be very easy. Think of, think of something like waking up early, 6 a.m., and spending time with the Lord. Do you feel like waking up at 6 a.m.? Now, some of, you, some of you, that's waking up late, right? If you woke up at 6 a.m., you'd be sleeping in, right? Not me. Whatever is early for you, whatever hour that is, do you feel like waking up then and doing a deep Bible study? Probably not. What do you feel like doing in that early hour? You feel like sleeping, right? But when we tell our feelings, I'm in charge, I'm in control, you're going to do what I say, and then you work at that laundry list of Christian disciplines. Then God is going to reward that obedience with grace and a more of a love for himself. It is a supernatural blessing that we get. And we can long for God. We can worship God when we first deny ourselves and then pursue him. And that's exactly what we see David doing in Psalm 63. As Jesus puts it, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added to you. You need your burden lifted. David needed his burden lifted. He didn't go to God and complain that Absalom took the throne. He didn't go to God and, and complain that he didn't have the pleasures that he had when he was a king. He was, uh, you can read about it in 2 Samuel 15 and on. He was starving, and he had to find bread. He had to find food. He didn't complain about those things. Instead, during that time in his life, he goes to God and he longs for God. He rests in the love of God, as we're going to read. And God rewards that longing. He rewards that obedience. He rewards that faith with his blessing. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things shall be added to you. Go ahead and look at Psalm 63. And verse 1, O oh God, you are my God, early I will seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. 
he starts with proclaiming, Oh God, you are my God. Now that's significant. David is in a land of idolatry. And what he's saying here is Elohim, Yahweh, Jehovah, the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Joseph, the God of Moses, the God who created all these things. You are my God. He begins his prayer, his, his, his longing for God with putting God in his rightful place and, and confessing that God is his God. It says, early I will seek you. David was just like us. What does David feel like doing early in the morning? Probably sleeping, right? Just like you, just like me. But he says, early I will seek you. He doesn't say, when I feel like it, I'm going to seek you. He doesn't say, if I feel feel like doing my devotions this morning, I'm going to do them. What does it say? It says, I will seek you. There's that discipline. Early, I'm going to seek you. He says, my soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. And it paints this beautiful picture. But I want you to see here that when it talks about a dry and thirsty land, it's a euphemism. Israel, the, the south of Israel in the wilderness, is a very dry land. It's the lowest place on earth. It's very dry and very hot. You have to have water if you're traveling in that area. So he's using this illustration of a dry and thirsty land, but he's applying a spiritual reality to it, and that is it's, it's a spiritual desert as well. God's not here. God's not present. He's in the wilderness. He's far away from the temple, far away from the tabernacle. He's far away from worship. There is no God here. There's no spiritual activity here. People aren't rejoicing and worshiping and praising God here. It's a spiritual desert. Does that remind you of anything? Remind you should remind you of our culture, right? We're in a spiritual desert. There is a lot of unbelief. And what is David's pursuit during that when there is no god here when there is a spiritual desert then my soul will thirst for you my flesh will long for you and what he's doing here is he is completely putting himself in a mindset that only god can solve his problems that only god can take his burden only god can fix his issues and he longs for god he longs to worship god he longs to see God at work. He's not complaining here about his issues. A little bit at the end, he talks about his enemies. Verses uh, 9 through 11. But for the most part, he is just pursuing God. David is laying down his burdens by resting in the love of God. It says in verse 2, So I have looked for you in the sanctuary, to see your power and your glory. David delights in worshiping God in the sanctuary. This is a reference to the tabernacle in the midst of Jerusalem. He would go there and he would worship. He would see God's power uh, and God's glory on display. He'd be reminded of all the wonderful things that God did in the past for Israel. All the wonderful things that God did for David himself. And he'd worship there. And that worship would lead him to understand God's love. Where do you go to worship? Where do you go for worship? Perhaps at church in part, but perhaps just at home, at your desk with your Bible open. Where do you find yourself praying the most? Maybe in your car, maybe in your living room, wherever it is, wherever it is that you tend to worship God, look forward to that. Because that's God's power and glory on display. And that's what he's saying here. He's saying, I have looked for you in the sanctuary, and I've seen your power and your glory. I've met with God there. Do you know that right now, there's angels in heaven worshiping Jesus? The Bible says in Revelation that they cry out day and night, holy, holy, holy are you. 
And the idea of holy means separated. It means God is way above man, way above angels even. The Bible says that as far as the heavens are above the earth, so far are his ways above our ways, right? How far from us are, is the closest star, the sun? Anybody know? I highly doubt it because I had to look it up. 92 million miles away is the nearest star. And that passage is saying as far as the heavens are from us, that's how far God's ways are above our ways. Those angels are crying out, holy, holy, holy are you. You're so far above us, I can't comprehend it. I can't even fathom who you are. You are holy, holy, holy. And they're crying out day and night. And when you get a grasp of how great God is, when you get a grasp of how much God loves you, when you get a grasp of how much God hates your sin and what it means to be forgiven of that, that will cause you to worship, right? We don't think enough about the wrath of God. We don't talk much about the wrath of God. But the wrath of God is written about 300 times in the Old Testament. God is a God of great and terrible wrath. Revelation 14, 11 talks about the, the smoke from hell is constantly rising up as a reminder in heaven, to all those in heaven, of the wrath of God. The smoke of their eternal torment rises up day and night, and it's a witness God is a God that absolutely, perfectly hates sin and pours out his hatred for sin in his wrath in a place called hell, and it lasts forever and ever, and it's supposed to last forever and ever as a reminder to us. And we don't often think about that. But if you're saved, if you're born again, Jesus is standing in the way of that wrath and saying this person is protected from God's wrath. Not only that, but this person gets the perfect love of God, the rest and the blessing that we don't deserve. God loves little old you that much. You're supposed to be down there. Instead, you get to be in God's dwelling place forever and ever. How much can you, can you get alone and just rest in the gospel? When you do that, it allows you to lay down your burden. This is what David is is saying in verse 2, or this is what is implied in verse 2 and verse 3. I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. I've gotten a glimpse of how great God is. Those angels singing holy, holy, holy all day long, all night long, are proclaiming the grace of God. I've caught just a glimpse of that at the temple, at the sanctuary, he says. And it causes him to respond in verse 3. Because your loving kindness is better than life, then my lips shall praise you. God is a God of wrath. He gives great love and great blessing. And as you rest in that love, as you rest in that grace, you're going to find that his love for you, verse 3, look at it. Your love for me, your loving kindness is better than what? It's better than life. Remember, David is on the run for his life. And he's saying, it's better for me to rest in the love of God than to be alive. Paul said that all is rubbish compared to gaining Christ. Think about the things that you love in this life. You know, I got something I love in the middle of my living room. It's called a lazy boy recliner. I look forward to sitting there. I rest my weary bones there. It's just a a bunch of wood and cushions, but I delight in it. I delight in other things as well. I delight in my family and my friends and my church. But compared to the overwhelming love of God, those things are nothing at all, right? He says, your loving kindness is better than life. And because of that, what am I going to do? I'm going to praise you. I'm not going to go to God and just complain and moan and groan and wail and cry about all woe is me, my burdens. 
I'm going to get before God. I'm going to worship in the sanctuary. And because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips will praise you. And here we see David laying down his burden. He is on the run for his life. His son wants to take the throne. He has so many things to worry about. But when he humbles himself and he worships, he gets to a place where he says, the love of God is greater than all those things that I delight in. Verse 4. Thus I will bless you while I live. Thus I will bless you while I live. Because I understand the love of God, because you understand the love of God, then you'll bless him. You might not feel like waking up at 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. and blessing God. But when you consider the loving kindness of God, when you consider how far he's gone to save little old you and how much God hates your sin, then you want to bless him, right? You want to praise him. You want to wake up early and study your Bible. You want to connect with him. You want to invite strangers into your house and be hospitable. You want to make disciples so other people can know the joy of the Lord, right? It's a response to these things. So when you're burdened by your laundry list of Christian disciplines, working hard for the Lord, serving at church, praying with your spouse, praying with your family, leading your family members to the Lord, if you start with humility and getting in front of God and worshiping, it's all going to be so much more natural. It's all going to be so much more easier. You're not going to feel like doing it, but you're going to tell yourself, I'm going to do it, and then God blesses, and then you feel like doing those things. He says in verse 4, thus I will bless you while I live. Now, David is implied here, he doesn't know how long he's going to live. Right? Absalom is, taking, is trying to take his life. He has a core group of mighty men that are pursuing David so that Absalom can have the throne. David knows that he's the king. He knows that he's the anointed. But he knows that he's not going to live forever. Who knows? Maybe God only has a couple years left for him or a few days left for him. He says, I will bless you while I live. And that's saying for the rest of my life, I'm going to make it a point to bless you. I will lift up my hands in your name. That's a, a, a position of prayer for, for the Jews. As they lift up their hands while they pray. As if they're expecting God's blessing. And this is what he's saying. As a result of verse 3. Verse 4 begins with the word thus. As a result of verse 3. Your loving kindness is better than life. Thus I will bless you. As a response to God's love. We love him because he first loved us. Right? You were smitten at some point in your life with the love of God. And so you've decided to follow Jesus as a response to that. Sometimes we have to go back to that decision and say, it's not because I feel like doing those things. It's not because I feel like breaking relationships with people that in my life that hate Christianity. But because I am smitten with verse 3, the loving kindness that's better than life, therefore I will praise you, therefore I will bless you for the rest of my life. While I live, I will praise you. I will lift up my hands in your name. This is how our burden is lifted. And when you do that, when you choose to pursue him, even when you don't feel like it, you're going to find out that he is more satisfying than your desires for pleasure. He is more satisfying than the things that you think that you need. You think you need money. You think you need respect. You think you need everything to work out just right. You're going to find that he really satisfies. Verse 5. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, thinking of a, of a feast, a banquet table, full of rich foods, my soul will be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. The love of God actually satisfies when you say no to yourself, say no to the idols in your life, the things that you tend to look for, uh, for pleasure and for desire more than you look to God. 
And you're going to find as you connect with him, as you worship him, and as you pursue those righteous things, those, those Christian disciplines, that you're satisfied in doing it. It can be satisfying to share the gospel, even if you fail, even if it's awkward. It can be satisfying to pray with your spouse and your kids, even if that means that you have to get over some baggage to do that. It's satisfying to live for him, even if it means letting go of your sin. You're going to be satisfied when you rest in the love of God. Your burdens are going to be lifted in the light of God's love for you. David pursues God, and God blesses with his love, being full of the Holy Spirit, being full of the fullness of God. God's grace that he gives will help us want to continue on in those disciplines. So what are you burdened with this morning? What are the things that are just weighing down your soul? When you spend time with the Lord, even when you don't feel like it, those burdens become more and more lifted. In the light of his love, in the light of his grace, in the light of how great he is, as you worship him, your burdens are lifted. How to rest your heavy burden on the Lord. How to rest your heavy burden on the Lord. What we see in these passages, what we see in other places in scripture. Number one, as much as you can, get your eyes off of self and onto Jesus. As much as you can, get your eyes off of self and onto Jesus. If you spend all your time wallowing in your misery, wallowing in your pity, telling yourself how bad you have it, and you just kind of eat and consume that dissatisfaction, what's going to happen to you? You're going to become more and more depressed, right? You're going you're gonna to feel more and more burdened. The more you look at yourself, the more you long for your pleasures, your, your desires for pleasure, the more unsatisfied you're going to be. But if you start getting eyes off of self and you just start worshiping Jesus as much as you can, blessing him in front of people, sharing with people the word of God, praying with people, praying more in your daily life, as your eyes are on Jesus and less on yourself, your burden is going to feel lighter and lighter and lighter. And you're going to be able to deal with it. As much as you can, get your eyes off of self and on to Jesus. We tend to be people that love a good pity party. Anybody relate to that? We love a good pity party. We love to feel bad for ourselves and tell the people we're close by, uh, close to of what's wrong. And they come and they pat us on the back. They love us and they hug us. And then we feel good, right? And that could be fine. There's a, there's a time and a place for that. But you're always going to have a burden. And Jesus is always saying, seek ye first the kingdom of God and these things will be added to you. He's always saying, come to me and I will give you rest for your soul. He's always saying, I stand at the door and knock. He who comes to me, I will come in and fellowship with him. It is a permanent invitation. As much as you can, get your eyes off of self and on to Jesus. Secondly, rest in grace. Rest in grace. That's what David's doing here. He's pursuing God. Early I will seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you. He is resting in grace. Your loving kindness is better than life. Therefore, my lips shall praise you. He's resting in God's grace. And thirdly, Saturate yourself in the gospel. I am so uh, thankful for this book that I read a few years ago called Gospel. And I've recommended this book highly in church before. Uh, this book centers around a prayer uh, that if we pray and if we mean it, then we will be resting in the gospel. On the back of your bulletin is that prayer. It says Gospel Prayer by J.B. Drew. And there's a few parts to this prayer that is, as you pray this and as you meditate on these, these things, they're all straight out of Scripture, you're going to find yourself saturated in the gospel. God, help me to know that there is nothing I can do to make you love me more. Nothing I have done that has made you love me less. Aren't you glad that's true? 
There's nothing you can do to make God love you more. God loves you with a perfect love. It is, you cannot add to perfection, can you? You cannot get God to love you more. And sometimes we get wrapped up in legalism and we, we tend to say, if I spend so much time with the Lord, I'm better than other people and God loves me more. Is that true? No, it's not true at all. There's nothing we can do to make God love me more that you cannot add to perfection. And nothing I have done that has made you love me less. We need to be reminded of that too. Because we sin daily and we can tend to feel really bad for our sin and say God doesn't love me as much. There is nothing that we can do to make God love us more. You cannot subtract from a perfect love if you're saved, born again Christian that you have. In Christ is all I need for everlasting joy. In other words, your loving kindness is better than life. Christ satisfies the heart. When we look to him, we are satisfied. In Christ is all I need for everlasting joy. As you have been to me, so I will be to others. I will measure your compassion by the cross and your power by the resurrection. When you rest in the idea that you, little old you, with all your sins, that God hates with a perfect hatred, all those sins are wiped away and God loves little old you now with a perfect love. When you rest in that truth, when you saturate yourself in the gospel, when you humble yourself and saturate yourself in the gospel, you're going to find that your heavy burden is lifted and it's easier to bear, not by yourself, but because you're depending on Jesus to bear it with you. You're going to find that it gets easier and easier and easier. Saturate yourself with the gospel. Get eyes off of self and onto Jesus. The formula for laying down your burdens and praising God all over again is to, number one, humble yourself before him. Admit that your heart is an idol factory and you pursue pleasure and you have been worshiping the creature rather than the creator. Number two, saturate yourself in the gospel. The truth that God loves little old you even at your worst. His love is best. It has never changed for you and never will change as long as you're a born-again Christian. And comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. When you're burdened, you need to be filled with the fullness of God. That's a grace that comes supernaturally from God to you and makes you want to follow him because he first loved you, because you're worshiping him. And when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, when you're filled with the fullness of God, as you're comprehending God's love, then your burdens are lifted. That's what we see here. It's what we see over and over in Scripture. So what is burdening you today? What are you struggling with? Can you get alone with God, with his book, and just take eyes off of self and worship him? And you're going to find Jesus is your burden taker. He is the one that removes it and makes it easier for you to bear. Aren't you glad that God is that way in your life? Aren't you glad that God is that way in us? We truly have a relationship with him where he says, I will guide you, I will shepherd you. I will make it easier for you. Come to me with your burden. You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus wants to be the one that we go to to rest our burden. Let's pray. Lord, we are so thankful that you are the lifter of our heads. You are the one that we can go to to lay down our burden. Lord, you stand at the door and knock, and you have an open invitation for anybody to come to you and fellowship with you and worship you. Lord, and as we do so, our, our burden is lifted. God, we thank you so much for that. We can't get through this life without you. Lord, there's people in here that are struggling with pain, with difficulty, issues of health, issues of bills, Issues that are too much for them to deal with. Lord, there's people here that are burdened with sin, addicted to sin. 
people that are addicted to going their own way, worshiping themselves as an idol, and they know it. As we go to you, God, as we repent, we're so thankful that there is forgiveness after forgiveness after forgiveness in your grace. Lord, we're so thankful that you have taken all of that sin and put it upon yourself. Lord, I pray that you would just give us a glimpse of how great you are, a glimpse of, of how much you hate sin and how much you've gone out of your way to take our sin and you love us with a perfect love. I pray, God, that uh, this week or even today or even right now as we, as, as we close in a word of prayer and worship, that you would just remind us that you love us with a perfect love, that you love us with a love that cannot be added to and cannot be taken away from us. God, let us meet with you. We're all burdened. We all have our issues. God, I pray that we can stand in front of you and worship and our burden be lifted.